Throws it back and scores! Brady Leibold goes back and forth behind the net, comes out the right side and lifts the backhander up and in. Leibold right here on Dylan. Dylan comes back to the right of his own. Here's Leibold uppercut. Another right by Leibold. Coming out another fight, Brady Leibold got the right hand pumping on Tony Mann up and over top and trying to control him as Leibold got that jackhammer right going. Throwing a lot off the helmet. Now Cody Mann answering, but Leibold switched to left and he got a few more in there. Oh, you gotta be loving this if you're at the Civic Center. Tonight. Wow. Welcome back, everyone, to another edition of Hockey to Heroin, The Road to Recovery. This is episode number seven. Guys, uh, this episode, again, is proudly brought to you by Team Issued Limited. Team Issued is connecting all walks of life. Team Issued does this by recreating that special feeling of being part of something bigger. A community for all striving towards the same goal. Head over to www.teamissue.ca, guys. Check out the clothing. It's my uh, former teammate, Jesse Paradise. Uh, use promo code TOEDRAG15 to get 15% off your total purchases. Let me catch my breath here, guys, because I'm going to be honest, I'm a little bit nervous about this one. <laughs> um, as you guys know, I've been uh, kind of promoting this one a little bit. I'm really excited. And uh, um, again, uh, I had Terry Ruskowski on the other day and he needed no introduction and this guy certainly doesn't either um the pride of summerside pei doug mclean welcome to the podcast thanks man uh, good to be on good to be on um doug you and i actually we don't know each other and uh, i'll be honest with you um you know uh this podcast is fairly new and uh, i didn't really know what kind of response i was gonna get and uh, I didn't really know what direction I was going to go or, or what was going to come from it. And um, it was just me kind of promoting it and doing my thing. And it's kind of been a work in progress. But um, I reached out to you a little bit. I just tweeted at you. And um, I actually, you responded just by liking, I think, one of my tweets or something. And I didn't even sleep that night, I'll be honest. I think I woke my girlfriend up. It was like 1230. And she doesn't know, she doesn't follow hockey which is a nice thing for me, kind of, but, um, you know, she didn't know who, didn't even know who you were, but I mean, I wanted to wake her dad up because he was really excited about it the next morning, but, uh, um, you know, I just, before we get into this, I, I just want to say thank you because, um, you know, you agreeing to do this, it, it certainly means a lot to me. It's been a really rough, rough road for me, and um, I wasn't like a star NHL player by any means. Uh, I kind of shot myself in the foot, or maybe I wasn't even good enough. Who knows? But um, that's not my life anymore. Uh, but I have a lot of questions I want to talk to you about because, uh, like, you know, I, I like I'm fanning out right now. I'm sure you get this a lot, but. Like, you know, I'm a hockey player, but, you know, like I've been, you know, I watch you for the last 10 years on Sportsnet and, you know, I really respect you and respect your opinion of the game. And I think a lot of people do. So uh, I'm just really excited to have you on. And, um, you know, people know that you're obviously from Summerside PEI and you were inducted into their Sports Hall of Fame in 2010. And um, you're really good friends with Gerard Gallant. Um, what's that relationship like? And when did you get to know him? Well, first of all, look, I, I, when I read your, when you sent, I saw the Twitter thing to me and I, I sort of, uh, you know, I sort of checked you out a little bit and, uh, you know, I think it's pretty exciting what you're doing and, uh, you should be proud of what you're doing, man. And, uh, it's, it's not, uh, it's not an inconvenience for me to go on with you. I, uh, you know, I, I appreciate that you followed me on Sportsnet and, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to come on and, and talk hockey with you so don't ever feel that uh it's it's not that big a deal i'm not that busy man so it's kind of fun but to answer your question i, I met Gerard Gallant when he was probably seven or eight years of age uh he was hanging around you know he was a he was a kid that like yourself probably hung around the rinks and i was i was uh, after college i went back to summerside and i taught high school and uh so i met gerard as a young kid hanging around the rink and then uh, i actually taught him in school i was a school teacher if you can believe it and uh, i always tell people that i remember the time i said to my class well what do you guys want to do when you uh, when you get out of school well, gerard at this time was 16 and and he said he, he wrote down he wanted to be a postman and i said to him he was going to the quebec major league in the in the following year and i said hey Gerard, I think I'd focus on hockey if I was you and forget about the postman deal. So we've chuckled over the years and, uh, you know, I coached him a little bit in Summerside and 
then I uh, actually hired him to come with me to Columbus as a uh, assistant coach when I started the franchise in Columbus and he was with me 10 years there and uh, obviously we're great friends we hang out in the summer we see each other quite a bit I just talked to him the other day so look he's a he's a great friend and I'm really proud of what he's done in the game. And uh, I actually, it's funny, I taught him in school, and I actually coached him in Detroit. I was the assistant coach and associate head coach in Detroit when, when he was playing with the Red Wings. And I was there with Brian Murphy before I went to Florida. So we go way back. So it's pretty funny. To me. Yeah, well, I, I knew oh, that, and that's why, that's why I asked. And, yeah. um, you yeah. know, you had, you had a lot of success, Doug, uh, you know, with Florida starting off there. Uh, um, a director of player personnel and, and scouting their first year or first couple of years there. And uh, obviously you had tremendous success in the 96 Cup Final. Everybody wants to talk about that. Uh, I actually uh, reached out and, and, you know, left some people, uh, you know, said, hey, do you have any questions for Doug McLean? And you'd be surprised how many people reached out. We'll get to that in a bit if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, no but a lot of, you know, you get a lot of the same questions probably, obviously, than the 96 Cup final, um, and then when you went to Columbus, you guys, you know, your inaugural years with Florida and Columbus, you had a lot of success. Uh, and then actually, you know, I, there wasn't any other teams really that had that much success as far as expansion teams goes until your friend Gerard went to Las Vegas. So he kind of went up to you. And uh, I mean, you guys are friends, so obviously you're proud, proud of what he's done there. And I just wanted to touch on that. But yeah, you're, you're from Summerside PEI, and if people don't know you, um, graduated from the University of New Brunswick and got your bachelor degree there and uh, then you went to Western University here in Ontario uh, and got your master's in education and that's before you went back to teach uh, Gerard yeah actually it was it was after I taught Gerard I went back and did a master's in in educational psychology at Western and then that was it's funny I went back to do my master's and thought okay I'm gonna I ended up being assistant coach with the London Knights that year, and uh, then I, I and then I get into college coaching after that. So I taught you before I went back to university. So I was like, I think I might have when I was teaching you. I was probably twenty five or so years of age. So you know, I, he was it was early on. So yeah. it's pretty funny. So you know, it, it, I followed him closely. Obviously, that uh, that run in Vegas was. Uh, was really cool and it's bizarre how it happened i mean i i I go to the stanley cup finals as a third year with a third year expansion franchise and he goes to the stanley cup finals with a first year expansion franchise and we're both from the same town and unfortunately as i said we're having breakfast there after he lost out i said unfortunately we both didn't win the stanley cup or would have probably helped things out but and then it was bizarre because we both got fired i got fired a year and a half after going to the finals with the panthers and he got fired a year and a half after almost to the same day yeah well that's just the way the hockey world works yeah it's just the way the hockey world works and and uh you know i think um it'll be movies will be made about what what they did in vegas i'm sure of it and um people are probably fighting over the rights it was so it was so good to see, and I I mean when I had him in uh, in Columbus, you know he's assistant coach, and and uh, you know he was he he had coached junior the year before junior tier two before I hired him to come to Columbus, and like I said, we were together for nine years, so so we became tight, and we have I, I, it's hard to believe when we get together in the summer, we have you know whether we're playing golf at PEI or just having breakfast or something, we. We have some great laughs about all the uh, all the time we've spent together. I mean, I know all. Of, Jordan came from a family of eleven kids in Summerside, and I mean, I knew all his brothers and sisters. I still run into them in the summer. We have great chats, so it, it's just a, a a great relationship, and he's a great friend, and I'm really proud of him to say the least. Yeah, absolutely, and you you know, um, so yeah, you you did coach one year at the University of New Brunswick, and. Then you made the jump to the NHL with the St. Louis Blues under Jacques Martin. That must have been an awesome experience. You guys, you guys had tremendous success in in '85 and in '86, I believe. And then you went from uh, there to Washington, and that's is that where you really developed your relationship with Brian Murray? You know, that's bizarre. I I, I was playing junior hockey in Brockville when I was 18 years of age. I played I played for the Montreal Junior Canadiens. 
Uh, and then I, play, I played for the Brockville Braves, and I ended up getting, going to the All-Star game in Brockville. This is when I was 18 or so. And I go to the All-Star game, Central Junior League All-Star game, and Brian Murray was the coach of the All-Star team. So I played for him in the All-Star game. We played against the Sudbury Wolves. And so we, I met him at that particular time, and then I didn't see him after that for a number of years, and I ran into him. When I was at university, he was coaching in the Centennial Cup, and I went over and introduced myself to him. And, and then later when I was at UNB, I introduced myself to him again at the draft. And, of course, we talked and laughed about the All-Star game. And then out of the blue, after my two years in St. Louis, I uh, I got a call. Would I be interested in coming to Washington to talk to him about the assistant coaching job? So it was bizarre. I met him when I was a player, and he was a coach and junior in Pembroke. He was coaching Pembroke at the time. And... Uh, you know, and then we ended up uh, being together ten years. So really went back to that All Star game in in, uh, in Pembroke, where I really met him, and and we've had a we had a lifelong relationship. So that might have been one of the most important All Star games I ever played in. Let me tell you, <laughs> yeah, to, meet, no, to meet Brian Murray, no and, kid, uh, to have the the time we had together. You know. Yeah, no kidding, and and I know you got to coach in a couple of NHL All Star games, and uh, I believe one of them was in Vancouver, wasn't it? No, the first one was in Boston. Oh, Boston, and, and okay. You know what? It was, it was in 96 in Boston, and it was unbelievable. So I, I get, I'm get i a first-year NHL coach, and I end up being the All-Star coach, and I go there, and that Ray Bork was on the team, and it, it, it was a 5-4 score. Ray Bork scores the winning goal with like 50 seconds left in the game to win at 5-4 in Boston. And the place goes nuts. And that's when the All-Star game, when the players tried. And I remember saying to them after the second period, I said, boys, let, let me just give you a little tip. You guys make pretty good money. If we win this game, I get 10000 bucks. So I'm coaching in the third period to win the game. So whether you like it or not, you better play harder. You're not playing. So I walked down the be- I walked down the bench in the end of the half. Well, about five minutes left in the game. Lindy Ruff's my assistant coach, and I said, "I'm trying to think of the kid's name. He was the first. He was the second overall pick in the Yash uh, draft by Tampa Bay. Oh my God, it just slips my mind. But he was a young defenseman playing in the All Star game for us. And I walked down and I said, "Bench him." He's not playing anymore. He can't play. He's not good enough to play in this game. Lindy, so bench him. We're not using him anymore. So I actually benched a guy in the All Star game, which was pretty <laughs> embarrassing when you think about. It. But I wanted, hey, I wanted the ten grand, man. So hey, I don't blame you. Know, I would have done the same thing. <laughs> I would have done the same anyway, thing. So it was a, it was a great experience. Then I actually, uh, I coached the next year in San Jose at the All Star game as well. I got one quick story to tell you there. Wayne Gretzky, my son Clark. Uh, had a, this unbelievable stick collection and Wayne was coming to the All-Star game so I phoned him and to Mike Burnett and said, I said can you bring a, an autographed uh, Gretzky jersey to the, or uh, stick to the All-Star game remember that Silver Easton that Gretzky used to Absolutely. use and, and I said is there any way I'd get one of those from my, for my son's collection so Wayne shows up at the All-Star game and he said hey uh, Mac I got, your, I got your stick here for you for your son and Clark was with me in the dressing room wow. and he was nine at the time so he gives him the stick so anyway Clark runs around the dressing room for two days stick boy he comes on the bench maybe one of the biggest thrills of my life having your son on the bench to coach an All-Star game and he was the stick boy on the bench and after the game Wayne Gretzky calls him over in the dressing room and said, hey, Clark, you were a big help on the bench today, and you've been a big help the last three days. And he takes off his game-worn jersey and signs it to Clark, your friend Wayne Gretzky. Wow. So anyway, which is unbelievable. Imagine it, Wayne Gretzky thinking to do that for kids. So then I meet, I meet uh, Wayne in Columbus a couple of years later, and he's there with Arnold Schwarzenegger at this big opening of this big event for, for the limited and I said to him, I, I met him at that function. I said, Wayne, I, I can't believe that you did that for my kid. I said, this is unbelievable. He said, Doug, I hope he's enjoying it because I'm still in shit with the NHL for giving it to him. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we had some great times, though. You know, it was, uh, you know, coaching in the All-Star games was a thrill of a lifetime. And the, I, I, I remember that particular game. And the last minute of the game, I put a, a lineup on the ice of Lidstrom, Coffee, Gretzky, Lemieux, and Messier. That, those were the five guys <laughs> I put over the board in the last minute of that game. I remember there was a real buzz in the crowd. 
and we just did it, you know, for Lindy was with me again as my assistant, and we we just did it for a little bit of fun, you know, and and boom, it was uh, it was kind of electric. But no I kidding. Mean, it was amazing to be quite honest to coach those. You know, you don't coach in an All Star game, but I coached because I wanted the damn ten grand. <laughs> back to back years, ten grand each year I made, so I was pretty excited. I bought my first BMW with my All Star bonus, so I was pretty excited. There you go. Hey, I know as a player, I know it. You know, in the once you get to pro, there's a you know a lot of money in the dressing room. Uh, goes on the board for certain different occasions. You know. Uh, yeah. guys' families are in town or whatever the case may be, if a losing streak or a winning streak, whatever. Some people may not know this if they're not familiar with the hockey dressing room, but in that situation in the All-Star Games, was there money on the board? There was no money on the board in, in that particular case, but, you know, it it always it always happened in the regular scene. Like, for instance, first time I went back to coach, when I was coaching Columbus, we went back to Florida to play. You know, or, or any time as an assistant coach, you, you'd put money on the board. I remember going back to Florida thinking, oh, man, I want to win this so bad. <laughs> so I put, I remember putting a grand on the board. And that was a lot of money in those days. In 90, that was in like 2000. I put a grand on the board. And, and I remember Robert Cron scoring the winning goal. It was, it was the happiest I've ever been in my life giving somebody a thousand bucks. So Yeah, no kidding. But, you know, there's, some, there's unbelievable stories. Like I, I was here a couple of years ago. When Babcock went back to Detroit with the Leafs, the Detroit Red Wings, it was $44,000 on the board for the winning goal to beat Babcock. That's how much the Red Wings wanted to beat Babcock. So talk about money on a board. No Dadson kidding. Put up, Dadson put up a team meal. Zetterberg put up a team meal. And plus forty four grand on the board to beat yeah. Babcock. So and and those team about, meals are probably around forty grand too. Right? Yeah, those four, the forty grand for a team meal probably too. So, uh, believe it. Yeah, like I mean, those guys have have good times, obviously. And um, uh, my next question too, and, and you know, like the topic of my my podcast, or it's originally a book idea, is is kind of like my the names kind of don't go together, like hockey and everyone. Obviously, my story is kind of like yeah. whoa, like I was homeless on Hastings, but there's been a lot, you know. Um, a lot of the talk, and I understand if it's a, this might be a hard topic for you to talk about because you're so involved in the game, and I can appreciate if if you don't ma- want to make a comment on this. But um, you know, there is, there has been uh, a few players, uh, quite a few players actually, with substance abuse history and uh, a lot of alcoholism, especially in the '70s and '80s. You hear about it, and it was just kind of like almost brushed off as part of the game. Um, but what really strikes me is, you know, like I think back to when Bob Probert got arrested um, back in 89. And I'm a huge Bob Probert fan and you had the chance to coach yeah. him. And I really want to talk about your time in Detroit and, yeah. and your time with yeah. Probert and, and Kosher and, and even Kevin McClelland, who I was supposed to play for when he was coaching in Wichita, but I never made it to him. I played against him, but yeah. Um, yeah. playing with those guys. And, and I don't know if you were there for when that happened, but Obviously, Probert struggled with addiction issues, and, and I read it in his book, and he was fairly open about it and whatever, but do you think the NHL does a good enough job addressing this, and or do you think that it kind of just gets swept under the rug? And do you think that if guys have problems, do they get the help they need, or do they get cast out of the league with a dark shadow? Well, you know, it's interesting. I When I saw your your tweet there I, it sort of hit home because my brother uh, who lives ha- happens to live in Vancouver and, and had a major uh, drug addiction problem spent uh, spent time in jail uh, you know for conspiring to traffic in a narcotic this was years ago and, and I dealt with him all through when I was early in the NHL my NHL days he was in Vancouver and down and out and, and we had some you know we had a, a, a ton of battles and I and I it's funny, I talked to him the other day and told him I was going on this show. He's been straight for 29 years. Wow. And, and, and I'm that proud of him, uh, you know, for, for, for battling through that. But you know what? I was with Proby for four years in Detroit, and it was, he, you know, he was in and out at that time. He was, he, you know, he's, he would fall off the wagon every once in a while. But for the most part, he was, he was really good. And you know what? One of the, one of the greatest guys... You, you could ever come across and talk about tough and you know he, he actually he actually came he and Sheldon Kennedy both came to Summerside and worked my hockey school one summer and that 
you know, come down and spend a week there with me as, as well as Sean Burb, who, who passed away from that Red Wing team, Ray Shepard, Jimmy Carson. They, they came to Somerset. But Proby, and Proby, was, Proby was by far the most popular guy I ever had to come to the school. But you look, coaching with him and dealing with him was, was really a treat because he was a, he was a really, really good person and a good guy. And, you know, he had major battles going back to his junior days in Sault Ste. Marie and on and on. But you know what? Uh, it, it's a sad story. I remember running into him in Chicago. Last time I saw him, he was in Chicago playing for the Blackhawks, and I had just started in Columbus. And I, I met him in the press box, and I went over and said, Hey, Proby. He said, Hey, Mac, how you doing? Uh, who are you with? I said, Proby. I'm with Columbus. Don't you read the damn hockey news? Like seriously. <laughs> so he didn't. He didn't. He didn't follow the game that close. He just wanted to play the game. And you know, even when he was fighting guys, like, I mean, I remember when he'd go against some of the. I mean, I was on the bench when he when he fought Domi. I mean, I was on the bench when he had the big fight with Crowder. You know, which were memorable fights. And no kidding. I mean. Fighters, fighters study the guys who they're going to fight. Proby never did. Proby just would go fight anybody. He would pit and pick his spots, you know. So, I, uh, you know, uh, I got to tell you one funny story. When he fought Cro- Troy Crowder, that was a big fight for him, you know. And he was on the bench, and Gerard said to him on the bench, he said, "Hey, Proby, uh, I'm going to go out, and, and Crowder's opposite me. I'm going to take 25, 30 seconds opposite Crowder. I'm coming on an early change." And you go out, so we get him a little bit tired tonight. So out to where he goes. He, he comes in the bench, Proby jumps over, and that's when he fought Crowder and dropped him. I mean, he dropped him that night, and it was it was electric in Detroit. And, of course, the, the Ty Domi fights in Madison Square Garden. I mean, those were unbelievable fights. But I love the guy. I, I thought he was a wonderful person. Did he get the help? You know what? The Red Wings really, they did everything they could for Proby. I, I got to tell you, the Yellich family went above and beyond. There was people in Detroit that worked hard for him, and I, I, I think, I think they did an awful lot for him. And I, I don't think even if Proby was alive today, I, I really believe he would say that that the Red Wings did as much as they could for him. And it's just a sad to see him pass away the way he did and a heart attack. And I mean, it, it, with young kids, it's devastating. But. He was a wonderful guy, and he was just a treat to be around. I'll tell you that. His teammates loved him. They loved him. No doubt about that. Yeah, and uh, it's no doubt a sad story, and I believe you, and I, I don't know uh, a whole lot about any of NHL organizations in, in the depth that you do, of course, but um, from what I've heard, I mean, Detroit, I definitely believe that. Um but Probert, like you said, was an extremely popular player, not just within yeah. his teammates in Detroit, like around the league, because he was tough. But like you said, he was. The, and usually the toughest guys are the nicest guys. And the, yeah. usually the guys that are hiding behind uh, mental health or depression or addiction. And um, uh, I didn't actually think to ask you this question before, but... Uh, I've talked about it on my last podcast with James McEwen, a guy that fought a lot in the minors and that, and, and uh, I fought quite a bit too, and just the anxiety, and, and even I heard Terry oh, yeah. Raskowski. Do you think guys like Probert dealt with that? You know what, I, I, I don't know. I, a lot of guys did. Look, I, it's funny, I, you know, I don't think Proby, you know, did it bother him. I don't think it really did. I, I, I never saw that side of me. Proby wanted to play hockey. He was a 30-goal scorer. I mean, this guy was an unbelievable talent and, and an important player on the team. And, you know, he, he didn't he didn't go looking for it. He wasn't just a goon. He, was, he, was just a, he wasn't just a tough guy. He was a real good player, too. But, I, you know what, I, I feel for guys. I had Paul Laws in... in in Florida, Lazar fought 50 times in that 95-96 season. Wow. I used to go down the bench and say, Paul, you're not fighting. Lazar, you're not fighting tonight. And he'd get so damn mad at me because he would do whatever it took. But I don't know if Paul, I don't think Paul was bothered by it either. But I've read and heard of guys that, that really had a hard time with it, that they had to get pumped up for a fight and they were worried about fighting. And I, you know what, I, I, I hate to see that. And I, you know, as a coach in the league, and I was in the league for 22 years, I never, ever once told a guy they had to fight. I, I told guys they couldn't fight, 
but I never once ever told a guy to go and fight somebody. Obviously, you send a message as a coach, and they know it, but I never told a guy, you go out and fight him. What about a... Only, sorry, what about a non-verbal? What about a non-verbal, Doug? Like, well, uh, uh, here's, here's the non-verbal. I mean... I we I had traded Christoph Olawan. I mean, oh, he he drove me crazy. This guy, he drove me crazy. And and we had battles like you can't imagine. I I, I can't tell the stories about Olawan because they're not <laughs> printable. But anyway, I I ended up trading him, and I, I feel bad about trading him, but I but I did. And and then he was coming back to Columbus, and he was shooting off. He was gonna you know terrorize the Blue Jackets. He was gonna do this. He was gonna do that. We had signed Jody Shelley uh, from Calgary. He, he was playing in the American League with St. John and Jim Clark, our, our director, our pro scout, our assistant GM, said, Doug, this kid is a good kid. He's a tough kid, but he's also a quality guy. We signed him for Syracuse, not thinking he was going to be an NHLer, to be quite honest. So I said to Jimmy, we got all the walk coming in. Let's bring Jody up. Jody comes up. He's on the bench. I'm coaching. All the was on the ice. I send Jody out to play you're talking about messages i sent him out okay jody and olawa fought it was a great fight jody beat him jody played tw- the next 12 years in the nhl never spent one day in the minors for the next 12 years and became a really important guy in our dressing room he, he was a guy that could play six or eight minutes picked his spots never had to tell him what to do but he did his job and Today he's a broadcaster for the Blue Jackets. He's had a great career, and he's just a freak, amazing guy. So, did I send messages? Yeah, I guess probably I did, but I never told him he ever had to fight anybody. So, I, some of my most, some of my favorite guys in the league were were the tough guys. But I had Todd McEwen in St. Louis, who was a tough, tough kid, fought Proby a lot. I mean, I, and he he. Uh, committed suicide yeah. obviously he had major problems i mean i didn't know it at the time because when i was with todd he was a kid you know i didn't know what happened after later in his career so do do guys feel the pressure sure they do is it an awful job sure it is do you, you know I, I and and as far as addiction problems in the league i think the league tries to help people but come on i i knew i heard about it i remember when i when i left the league i i i I, I said, come on, boys. There, there's issues. There's issues here, you know. And and the, you know. And I I remember talking to Kipper about. It. I said, Kipper, the, the league's got some. The league's got some issues with with drug problems. You know, we it's it's. But you know what? And all of a sudden, it's starting to come now. I, I know they do a great job with the with the rehab program. I sent I've sent kids to the program. It's confidential, but I have of to course. send you know numerous players. I. I I don't know. I ha- I don't know. You know, most of the guys seem to have done okay, so I, I guess I would take that they did all right of it. But look, there was lots of guys that had lots of problems. There's no denying that. So no denying I, it, and it's it's tough. My my next question, and, and I don't want to relate this into any re- way. I'm not. This is not a segue into from what we just talked about. Uh, this is just on my list, and uh, um, you actually drafted um, a guy that I played against my entire life and he was always better than me and we grew up together in the lower mainland uh Gilbert Brule you drafted him six yeah. overall um yeah. I never really got to know Gilbert that well um he was yeah. a very quiet kind of reserved person and um I want to tell you a funny story actually about this one game in Bantam um his dad Chris and um me and his dad uh, I had a lot. Of, I was a very mouthy player. I don't know if you've ever talked to anybody that ever coached with me. Or, I was a mouthpiece. I was, you know, I was like Derek. I was like Derek Dorsett. That's who I was. And and I fought. And I fought Dorsett in junior. He broke his hand on my face. And you know what I mean. I had more points than him in junior. But obviously Dorsett has balls. And and uh, I had to- talked to him when he retired. But um, Brule. So when I was in Bantam. <laughs> Uh, he was obviously first overall in the WHL Bantam draft uh, that year. Uh, this is before this happened, but um, his dad, Chris. So anyway, some guy, Brule, we were playing a game in Port Coquitlam, my hometown. North Shore Winter Club was there. And uh, Brule had a, he had like five goals or something stupid. And uh, in like a 5-2 win or something. And when I was coming off the ice, I picked up the puck. 
uh, the game puck or something. And I, I think actually some kid broke his leg, if I remember correctly, and the ambulance had to come, and it was like almost at the end of the game. So I picked up the puck, and Chris Brule actually came up to me and was like, hey, can I have that puck? And I'm like, no, it's my puck. And he's like, I'm like, why do you want it? He's like, that's Gilbert's 1,000th minor or uh, minor hockey career goal. And I'm like, oh, yeah? I'm like, how much is it worth to you? And uh, I ended up selling him the puck for, like, 40 bucks or something. And then, like, the next week he took out a page, uh, like, a full-page ad in, in one of the newspapers about this 1,000th career goal. And the puck, sure enough, is in the newspaper. And me and my dad had a good laugh about it. But Gilbert was an incredible minor hockey league player and an incredible player in the dub. But... um. What are your thoughts on him? He's playing in the KHL, but I mean, you, maybe you can't say a lot about it. But I mean, what happened with him? You could have taken you could have taken Anze Kopitar instead of Gilbert Boulay. What you know, like what happened? Well, there? Here, here's what happened. I mean, we we went into that draft, and if you look at that draft, you say, okay, you know, Sid Crosby was one, uh, Bobby Ryan was two, Jack Johnson was three, Pouliot was four. Price was five, and I'm sitting at the sixth spot. And to be quite honest, we did not. We were we were down. We had two guys. We were down to two guys. It was Kopitar or Brule, or who were on our list. And we really believed that Brule would go to Montreal at five. Everybody, everybody in hockey thought Brule was going to number five to Montreal. So. I look at that draft today. So I remember I, I made the call on it. I remember sitting there saying, and I watched Brule a lot that year. He was so unbelievably good. It was scary how good he was yep. in, in Vancouver in the in the Western League. And anybody, if anybody tells me that if I didn't take Brule at six, that Chicago weren't taking him at seven, or Ottawa weren't taking him at eight, or anybody behind me weren't taking him, they're they're full of shit. See, <laughs> he was he was rated right there on everybody's list he was that good so anyway i we we're sitting at the table at the draft table and, and pierre dorian was a scout for montreal and he leans over to my chief scout and he said we're taking the goalie at fifth at five so i said okay so boydie we, we we've got we got brulee so but walk into that draft boy my chief scout and i were one of the draft and i said i had seen kopitar a lot too if you he was a Slovenian kid. Nobody had ever made it from Slovenia. And I said to Boydie, one of that, Boydie, how do we take a Slovenian kid over this North American kid, Brule? How do we do that, Boydie? And I, you know what? I had, I had, had experience with Zherdev. He was driving me crazy. <laughs> he, I, and, I, and I said, Boydie, you know, I got to take the North American. So it was my call, and Boydie was fine with it. But the fact that I have taken so much grief over Brule and Kopitar in Columbus and every, everybody that wants to rip me talks about that particular draft. And I'm saying, okay, just a minute. I didn't take Kopitar at six, but how the hell did he go to 12? What happened to <laughs> Dale Talon? Take it? Dale Talon took skill A. Brian Murray took Brian Lee, who never played a game in the NHL. I, you know what? I tra hey, I trained with that kid, and I couldn't believe that that kid even got drafted where he got drafted. I skated with him in the summer, and he came, and he had all this right. gear, Ottawa gear on. I'm like, who is this kid? That, what? He got drafted where? Who is he? Yeah, exactly. But anyways, so you were saying, Kopitar go ahead. Filed, Kopitar falls all the way to 11 or 12 with L.A. And you know what? And, and I'm saying, okay, I deserve a little heat for not taking him in at six. But what the hell about these other guys? Dale Talent, Brian Murray, Doug Wilson, <laughs> they all had a chance at him. And all of a sudden he ends up in, in – uh... now, if you did that draft over today – oh, one other thing. The genius Pierre Maguire that he thinks he is – I don't think so, but shooting, okay. Was, was shooting his mouth off on TSN when, when, when Price went to Montreal – Pierre Maguire went ballistic on TSN on the draft, said, how can Montreal Canadiens do this to their franchise? How can they do this to their fans? How do they justify taking price over Brule in this position? That's what he said. Then five years later, he was ripping me for taking Brule over, <laughs> you know. So, so anyway, I, I get a kick out of it. But, but anyway, you know what? 
Brule came in. And I knew his dad was a bit of a problem. I had met with the dad before the draft. I knew all the history there. I liked Jill Bear. He was a quiet kid. I really liked him when I drafted him. He comes in with us. He breaks his leg in camp. He fractures his sternum a little later on. He had concussion problems. This was a quality kid. I sent him back to junior after his first training camp. I go to the Memorial Cup in Moncton and watch him play for Vancouver a year after we drafted him. And everybody in the Coliseum in Moncton was coming up to me saying, oh, my God, have you got a star? He was so good at that Memorial Cup. Vancouver didn't win it. They lost to Moncton in the finals with Teddy Nolan coaching. But he was so damn good watching him there. I think, oh, man, I got a star. This is a year after the draft. Yeah, I know he. It didn't. It didn't happen, and it, and I I still think the world of Joe Bear. He had problems, you know. His his you know, you know, for some family issues. But anyway, he was a quality kid, and I and I still think the world of him. And you know what? I I know this, and Berkey and I talk about this all the time. Berkey said, "Doug, they're full of shit." We all had Brule at numbers five or six. <laughs> we have everybody had him there on the list, so. You know, we sort of laugh at it because all these experts after the draft that aren't the guy making the selection, it's really easy to be mouthy. Well, I remember, if anyway, if, if I, I remember know, correctly, the, the top prospects game was in Vancouver that year, and Crosby, yeah, didn't, even, Crosby didn't even come because right. it was Crosby versus Brule, and that was the headliner for the game. And uh, That's right. I'm not saying Crosby didn't come because Brule was there. Um, no, no. But... Uh, it would have been interesting to see, and uh, he, he definitely he deserved to go at number six. He was and, considered. Yeah, he was considered the Crosby of the West. He yeah, really he was. really was. But you know what? It, and you know what? It, look, you go through the drafts, and there's lots of guys that that don't turn out. But I, I, if I had to do it over, but you know what? The amazing thing is, if you redid that draft, Kopitar would be the second. Him or Price would have been number two overall. It would have been. It would have been Sid number one, and it would have been either Kopitar or Price at number two in that draft if we, if that was redone. Unfortunately, as a GM, you don't get to do <laughs> redos of drafts. Yeah. You know, I got it's to play. I got to play with that. Gilbert and Kerry Price uh, with like uh, the under seventeen program in BC. What do you right. th- What do you really think of Kerry Price these days? I, you know what? I, I really, I mean, obviously, I got a lot of respect for him, and you know, he's he's battled a lot of injuries, and he's he hasn't. He hasn't been as good at times. And, you know, what can you say about the winningest goalie in Montreal Canadian history with the people that have played for that franchise? So, look, he's had an unbelievable career. The team hasn't been good enough when he was at his best to, to win. He, I, the, the devastating one was when he got injured in playing the Rangers that series, you know, and they, and they, they would have had a chance to go to the finals and, and do some damage. But I, I... I, I think he's had just an unbelievable career, unbelievable career, and he's a he's a he's a team guy, and he's a he's I, I don't know Carey Price, but he seems like he'd be my sort of guy. I just I like his I like his attitude. Yeah, I really have you, do. Have you ever seen? Actually, I when he we, when I was nineteen, uh, he was with the Tri City, and um, yeah. he came. They came and whatever they were doing their pregame skate, and you're familiar with the game rebound, obviously. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, any hockey players fans, you guys know what that is, but uh, they were playing, but Carey Price was shooting on Chet Picard, who was the backup goalie who ended up, I think he ended up going to the World Juniors too a couple years later, but he, yeah. Carey Price was playing as a player, but he took off his chest protector, but he had his goalie pads on, but he grabbed player gloves and a stick from somebody, and he started the game, and I think this guy went five for five, like all over, not like bar down. This He had a harder shot than most of the guys on the team. I, like literally, guys were coming out of our dressing room to come watch him play rebound against the other goalie. That's the kind of, like, you know what I mean? That was the kind of, and then we played him, and then every time we dumped the puck in, he was firing it back out the puck. I remember Dean Chanel losing his mind on the bench because we weren't dumping it in the corners properly or whatever, but... Um, yeah, it's it's kind of interesting, you know, and I appreciate you opening up about your brother, and and that's an interesting story that you know, and I I do appreciate you you sharing that with me. That that uh, that's that's awesome, and I that's great that he's doing so well. And um, I have a couple more things I want to talk to you sure. about, but um, no problem. You know, who is who do you think is the best player that you ever got to watch? Because I'm a huge Pavel Bure fan, and I was a kid. Was he really? 
like that explosive and that good back then, or was I just biased because I'm in Vancouver? Who was really the best? You know what? I, I I was somebody asked me recently on an interview who was who was the best players I ever coached. You know, and I and I sort of did I did the list of who I coached as the as the best guys that I had coached, and it it sort of went left wing Nash, center Iserman, right wing Brett Hull. And on defense, it was uh, Coffee and Lidstrom. Those those were the best guys <laughs> that that I and and Scott Stevens was right there with with because uh. I had him in Washington. So <laughs> Pavel Bure, that that was the list. And I'm like, wow, that, that was no so, kidding, man. I'm pretty, sitting here going, wow, pretty, that pretty Scott Stevens doesn't but, even make the list. Like, you know, come on. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> and he should have been ahead of Coff, but I I, I like Coff a lot. And he, Coff was so you know, I mean, he was he was a he was a piece of work, but he was I loved I loved the four or so years I spent with Coffee and. I I was only with Scotty Stevens two years, so, and he was young, a young guy in those days in Washington. But he was uh, he was special, let me tell you. But Burray, Burray, I coached against him a lot. I, you know what I, I, I he was so talented, and I and I really fought him close because my first day in Detroit as an assistant coach was the day that Sergei Fedorov defected from the Goodwill games in Seattle and came to yeah. so Sergei Fedorov's first day in Detroit was my first day in Detroit as well. Oh, so, wow. And I go way, I go way back with Sergei and, and I, uh, you know, obviously Sergei was with me in Columbus and, and we're, we're great friends and so on. And he and Pavel, I mean, came together really. They're on that great world junior line, but he, Pavel was a different player. He was so offensive, so skilled, so fast, so so talented. But I, 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 I never. I, I, I gotta tell you, I was more of a Fedorov fan than I was a Beret fan. I, yeah. and I, I guess because I coached Fedorov and he, I, he played the complete game. And he had a longer career, but Bure was special. There's no way he wasn't special, and I just didn't get to appreciate him because I was never ever around him. I didn't know him, but I coached against him, and that that was enough. I didn't really you know <laughs> he was he was that dangerous every every shift. He was dangerous. Did you did you ever have anyone who would you say is the most coachable, and would you even come and come clean with saying anyone who is like the least coachable? Where it was like, yo, you got to go. I know you mentioned somebody earlier, but is there anybody else too? Um, who was the most coachable? Where it was like you could be like, hey, you need to adjust this or that, and like they if yeah. they weren't getting it right away, you noticed that they were staying out extra. Like they really were committed to their game and to to really completing their game who would be that guy and, and who would be the guy with that maybe was like you know m let me rephrase that who, who was the guy the best guy and who was the guy that you could say that would be like was the most talented but couldn't get his shit together and could have had a way better yeah. career but didn't well it's, it's not even close i mean rob niedemeyer i had in florida he was 21 years of age and he was a high pick, and and Robbie scored both seasons there. If I'm not mistaken, he had 27 goals each year. I played him head to head, like in that year we went to the finals. I played him head to head against Adam Oates in the Boston series. I played him head to head with Lindros in the Philly series. I played him head to head with Lemieux in the in the Pittsburgh series. A head to head against the Lemieux Yager combination in that Pittsburgh series. And I played him head-to-head -head against Sackick and Forsberg in the, in the Colorado series. This was a 21-year-old kid that would do anything. He, he, was, he was a special, special guy. I, I loved Robbie Niedemeyer. I tried to trade for him later on. And he never had – but he was, a, he was a perfect guy. I mean, we know Scotty Niedemeyer's career, but Robbie, Robbie was a special guy too, but never had the career – never had the offense or never whether he was given the opportunity or not i don't know i don't understand how as a 21 year old he was scoring 27 30 goals for me and he never he never really got close after that you know so i i love that guy the guy that i that that i got it well jared Ebb was unbelievable like <laughs> i'm telling you something i have seen a lot of talented guys but the first day this guy skated and practice in columbus I have never seen a player as talented with the potential he had. It was over the top. And I, I talked to a scout the other day. They said he's still today going to looking at every draft 
would be a top five most talented kid that was ever taken in a draft was this guy. I'm telling you, wow. it was scary how good he was. And he was a nut bar. He drove me crazy. I mean, I had the cops following him in Columbus. I did everything. I liked him as a kid, but oh my God, he was the biggest pain in the ass of my life. And you know what? He ended up, he ended up his last year, he played in Philadelphia. And the year before that in New York, in New York, he had 50 plus points, 20 some goals, played average 12 and a half minutes ice time, didn't care, couldn't care less. Philly, I think in his last year in the league, he had 58 points, didn't try, didn't play that much. He was so good. He should have, he should have been a Hall of Famer. That's what he should have been with the talent he had. But you know what? He blew it. He blew it. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm actually writing a book right now and I'm going to do a, a sort of a chapter on that draft and him. And I, I was looking up where he is now. He played in the KHL a couple of times. We'll talk about a guy that blew his career. It, it was scary how good he was. How old and would he be now? I, I think he's, uh, well, he was, he was 18 in, what was that, 2000 and 2004, was it? Oh, was, was it he that? drafted in 2004, so 16 years ago. He's only 16, a couple years yeah, older than me then. Yeah, so he's probably, what is he, 40? Not even. If he's drafted yeah, in 2004, I'm 32, he'd be like 34, 35, somewhere like that. Is he uh, in like he an was, 85 or was, something? He was an 85, 84, 85. Yeah. Born. Yeah. Wow. That's what he was. And yeah, he, I re- he was scary. I remember actually being him uh, when I was playing. I played a lot of the video games as a kid, right? And he was uh, he was pretty incredible, like his potential, right, in the oh. video games. So if you, if you picked him in the video game, he got to be like the best player in the game in four seasons or whatever. But So I know what you mean. Even even they had him in the oh. video game pegged to be a, a great player. But, um, yeah, a few more questions, and then I'll let you go. So. Go ahead. Um, there's, uh, there was a couple questions that I wanted to ask you, but I was, I, there was a couple people that, uh, had the same question. So I save it for that. Uh, a friend of mine, Carson Grant, he, he wants to know the story about the rat. Uh, I'm a little bit familiar with it. Uh, it was Scott Mellonby, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, but, uh, the story of the rat and, and how that came about and just sort of the experience with that. I'm sure you've told the story a thousand times, but people love to hear it. And I sure would. You know, it, it, it happened in Miami Arena, and we had played a game. It was early in the season. I don't know if it was like game five or game ten of my first year coaching there. And, and uh, uh, Mellonby, there was a rat in the dressing room. A rat ran across the floor in the dressing room, and Mellonby killed it with his hockey stick. And Van Beesbrook went out after and talked to the media, and he said that, uh, you know, yeah, I was good tonight, but the real star was uh, Scott Mellonby. He had a rat trick. He had a rat trick tonight. He had scored two goals, and he killed a rat. <laughs> and it took off. It was bizarre. And we were we had won, I think, our fifth game in a row that night, and we were just the fans were just starting to fall in love with the team in Columbus. And that took it to a whole other level. Like, it, that rat thing was so bizarre. There was one game in the playoffs – the guys with, with told me after the game, they picked up 9,000 rats off the ice wow. in, in that game, on the ice, during the during the course of the game. Because they, they went, every time we'd score, they'd fill the ice with rats, and then they, they'd have, like, the orc and pest control. The guys dressed up as orc and pest control that would come out and pick up the rats. It was unbelievable what was going on. And, and they did a big article on my parents and PI, and every time we'd score, uh, a columnist was down doing a, this article on my parents, and Dan Levitard, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but yep. he's a big guy with ESPN now. So he went down and interviewed my parents and P.I. during the cup run. And uh, he, he came back and he, in the column, he said that every time we scored, mom and dad would throw socks at the TV. <laughs> so that story ends up in the Miami Herald in, in Levitard's column. And Wayne Izinga sent uh, uh, overnighted a box of rats to my parents' house. And Wayne Izinga was the owner of the team, multi-billionaire, and he sends a box of rats to my parents. So it became... I remember driving home from the morning skate and that rat craze, and, and there would be a bulletin that come on the radio here in Florida and say, hey, uh, J.C. Penny just got in an order of rats. Every, and everybody would race to J.C. Penny to buy these rats. So it was <laughs> bizarre, but it, it, be, it became a fun thing, and it was a real rally and cry, and Oh, it still pisses me off the NHL. You know what? They, they killed it. They they wouldn't let you do it. The same as the octopus in Detroit. I mean, it was such a fun thing. But 
I love seeing those rats come over. They used to drive the opposition people crazy. Oh, I remember Patrick Wah hiding in his net, right? Like, oh, that was, that's a great clip, isn't it? That's yeah. a great clip. Yeah. I'll never forget yeah. that. I was watching that as a kid. Yeah. And um, the yeah, next question, yeah, the next question's from uh, John Yakub. Uh, he just wants to know if uh, you could have done anything to change the outcome of the 96 Cup final. I know you guys lost in four, and uh, leading up yeah. to that, like if people don't know, like you guys had quite the battle to get there. Um, you know, it was what, game six, went to six games, and then game seven, game seven, and then you lost yeah. four straight, right? So um, what yeah. do you think there's anything you could have done, or, or was that Colorado team just too powerful? You know what? It, it still to this day really bothers me. We we finish we finish a seven game series against Pittsburgh. Uh, unbelievable series. We we're down in the series. We come back and won. We won game seven in Pittsburgh. We held, if I'm not mistaken, we held Lemieux and Yager to two points in that entire series. That that's how good we were. How we shut those guys down. Yeah. And it was a grueling series of six games against uh, Philly. So we finished the game seven in in Pittsburgh, and they put us on a plane that night and flew us to Colorado to start that series a day later. Like, that's a joke. That is today a joke. You'd get a, yeah. Today you'd get a week off. But Colorado had been sitting for five or six days, and, and we flew right out. And I remember game one, we had nothing. And it was two days after. We had nothing in the tank. But, but to be quite honest, we were, we were not – close to them i mean i remember looking at that team and it was like they were loaded they i mean starting with patrick and goal and their their defense was a big strong defense with foot and goose drop just a, a real tough blue line and then you and and matching up against sackick and forsberg was near impossible they were in the heyday so so you know what? I would have loved to have made it a, a tougher series, but they were really, really good. Our guys played their hearts out, and we just, in my opinion, we we just weren't good enough to beat them. They they were that good. They were that good. Yeah, and and just getting there must have been a, a really awesome experience. And I mean, not winning the cup, it's <laughs> that's got to hurt too. But I mean, I couldn't imagine yeah. some of, like you said, the, some of the stories you must have, and some of the, the stories you've shared today have been incredible. Um, James B um, wants to know, actually, I'm going to save that one. Troy McKinnon wants to know if you think there's going to be a playoffs this year. And I think they've already canceled it, if I'm not correctly. Well, they're going to, they're going to try, you know, like Batman uh, talked on Fox, uh, news this morning said look if we have to play into the summer you know we're gonna we're gonna try to finish the season if it happens it's gonna be some t- i mean i think they're crazy to worry about the regular season but they want to finish that because it's all about money and not having to give people back their tickets but it will be in buildings without any fans it will be a playoff in september and october and they would shut down for a month, and then they'd probably start next season in November. So if they can possibly get it in, because look, let's not kid ourselves. They want the TV revenue. They did, you know, they they need the ticket revenue. Or players are going to pay a big price next year in escrow. They want to finish it, but look, I, here's my question: How do you put twenty players on a bench, trainers, coaches, side by side? TV people, security people, staying in hotels. How do you make all that work if there's if there's any sign of coronavirus out there? I, I just, I mean, if one player gets sick or one player, God forbid, something happens to them, I mean, what? I, I just don't know how you do it. Honest to God, I don't know how you do it. But they're they're hoping to they're hoping to get it in, and they'll they'll play into August and September if they have to. But I. I I don't see it. I don't see it happening. I I don't like it myself. Um, I don't like hockey in the summertime. I, I think you know what I mean. It, just look at it as a, another lockout year, and um, uh, it's unfortunate, obviously, especially yeah. you know, it's a couple guys who are having incredible seasons like Carlson in Washington, and yeah. um, you know what I mean. And, and there's just and then I look at these guys that you know, twenty year olds in in the major juniors or in, in just junior gen, in general, like not getting to finish out their OA year or whatever if they're not going to go out and play. It gets heartbreaking, right? And um, it's unfortunate, but, you know, there's bigger things uh, in the works here. Um, uh, 
Colin uh, Kosolowski wants to know who your favorite player is uh, back uh, back in the day when you were playing or coaching uh, versus today, forward and defense. Hmm. Who was my favorite back in the day? That's, uh, well, you know, Liz, I, you know, how could you ever, you know, go against Lidstrom for me? I mean, I, he was so, he was so good. He, I mean, I remember the first day he walked, stepped on the ice with us in Detroit. He, this guy never had a, I was with him four or five years. He never had a bad practice. He never had a bad game. I remember coaching against him and trying to do everything you could to stop him. I mean, I, I, I mean, Lidstrom has got to be right there. I mean, obviously I, I didn't, I didn't coach in the or Gretzky era, but to me, it's Gretzky and Lidstrom in my era are are the two guys. And I, I coached against Wayne a lot. I mean, he was unbelievable. Uh, Lidstrom was unbelievable. Those would be the two guys in my era that were were way above. And look, I was with some. I mean, uh, Stevie Y was a great player in Detroit for us, no doubt about that. But. I, I mean, Gretzky and Lidstrom for me are the two guys, and that's just quickly saying that I I can't think of anybody that would be would be close to those guys, you know. And what about today? Today, I mean, I, I'm a I'm a Sid Crosby uh, fan. I, I just think what he's done uh, in his career for Pittsburgh. I mean, people forget Pittsburgh were last in the league before Sid got there. He he's made so many guys real players. He's he sets the tone for that entire organization. What he's accomplished in his career is over the top from Stanley Cups to Olympics to whatever he's done. And he's still a great kid. Like my son skated with him a couple of years ago at PEI in the summer. Clark was playing. My son was playing, you know, pro in Europe and a bunch of guys went on the ice. I went down at seven in the morning and watched Sid on the ice with these 12 minor league Quebec league guys and minor pros and, I said to Clark after I said, driving home, I said, how was Sid? He said, Dad, he was like one of the boys. He was so good. He was so great with everybody. And, I mean, I, I just have a ton of respect for this guy. I really do. So, And you know what? One of the greatest compliments I ever got when I was doing uh, my noon show in Toronto was Sid Watt listened to the show all the time, and he said, he used to say to Colby all the time, Colby Armstrong, he said, Mac gets it. Mac gets it. He's a hockey guy. He gets it. And I, you know, I, I think, you know, I'm a lot older than Sid, but it still meant a lot to me hearing Sid Crosby say that. So I think the world of him. I mean, I think he's yeah. that good. I mean, look, McDavid is a star. He's going to be special. But Sid's my, Sid's the guy for me. Yeah, and I'll share a quick story with you because Sid's my age, same birth year. I I never uh-huh. played against him when I was younger or anything, and so Gilbert, like I said, was the guy, right? And um, I honestly, when I heard somebody was better than Gilbert, I'm like, no, no, no. And then I remember looking at Sid's numbers as a 16 year old in the Quebec League. I'm like, okay, um, maybe he's yeah. better. But honestly, I'll I'll be honest, I. I wanted to hate Sidney Crosby for the longest time because I was jealous of him. You know what I mean? Um, and then in 2010, when he scored that game-winning goal, I went, this is no joke. I was home. I was not even in a very good way at the time or anything. And um, I was down there with my ex and, and a couple of friends. My friend Katie and her, her, they just mar- her got married to, to her husband, Braden. But we were down there. And the whole town, I'm not kidding. Like, yeah. you were, yeah. if you were there... There was millions of people, yeah. Sidney Crosby, like for the two hours. And for like the first 20 minutes, I'm like, I'm going home. I can't stand this. I was trying to like, hit it. and then after a while, I'm like, okay, whatever. I love this guy. He's the best ever. You know what I mean? And, yeah. And, yeah. and in that moment, I kind of was like, okay, you know what? Get over yourself. He's better than you. He has more class than you. He's, you know what I mean? He's just, you got to love this guy. Like, how can you not, you man? You know what I mean? So get over it. And so I have, and I can't agree with you I'm more. Um, you know, I've never got to meet him, but yeah, again, uh, it was just one of those things being immature and whatever. And now I can just look back and appreciate it. And I got to play with some great players. I played online with Jamie Ben and Kelowna and, um, yeah. You know, and he's a great guy too. I don't know if you've ever met Benny, but um, I, I actually, uh, before I get into these last questions, I have a question for you because I have played uh, with Tyson Berry in Kelowna too, and Tyler Myers and Luke Shen and Brandon McMillan, all these guys. Um, 
but people, and I played online with Steve Stamkos when I was with Tampa up there when he first got drafted. Yeah. So I played with these good players, but people, when people ask me who's the best player you ever played with or against, I say Tyson Berry because what he did as yeah. a 16-year-old, and now what, like, after Babcock got fired, he, you know, he turned his game around, and obviously he's an unrestricted free agent, and who knows if he's going to be in Toronto. What do you honestly think about him as a player? What do you think about his time in Toronto? Do you think they should re-sign him? Um, and what would you do if you were, you know, Kyle Dubas? Well, first of all, I, I mean, I, I could never figure out in Colorado what was going on because his name was always out there. It was always out there. And I remember talking to the assistant GM in Colorado and said, like, why why is who who happened to work for me for ten years in Columbus, Chris McFarland? I said, why why is Barry's name out there all the time? You guys try to trade him. He said, Doug, we're not trying to trade Tyson Barry, but if somebody offers us a, a number one or number two centerman, we would move him because we've got some guys coming. We love him, but if we needed a centerman that bad in, in Colorado. So he was he was on the block, but he wasn't on the block unless they got a big price for him, and and they ended up getting Kadri for him, I guess, which is which is you know he's been a pretty good solid guy there. I I think Barry's a he's he's a commodity that are that's hard to find. He's a puck mover. He's a point producer. For whatever reason, I don't get what happened to him in Toronto. I expected him when I saw that deal made. I said, oh, they they just got themselves a, a perfect guy to fit in with Matthews and Nylander and. Marner, I mean, I, I could only envision him and Marner together on the power play. And for whatever reason, it didn't work. Did he lose his confidence early in the season? What happened to him? I don't know. I still think Tyson will go somewhere and, and he'll end up having a good career. If I'm Tyson Berry, I, I look to move from Toronto. I, I look to go to the right spot, go to free agency, look for the right spot, the right fit. And uh, and and go and move on and uh, see what happens. But I I think he's good enough to be a star in the league, and he certainly was a disappointment in Toronto. Yeah, like when I saw that they signed him, I was really excited for him. Um, I haven't had a chance. Me and him were really close, and uh, when he was sixteen, I was twenty. But like, yeah, I just you know I just was watching him, and that's I think too. It was the confidence and. I don't know if Babcock sucked it out of him or, or what, but um, yeah, it was it was unfortunate because Tyson's extremely skilled, and, and I don't know if I if I was to talk to him, I'd say Tyson, did you put on an extra five or ten pounds? Because he looked a, 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 a like a half a step slower than what I yeah. than what I'd remembered him, and and I don't know if yeah. what that might be. It could be a lot of things, but um, um, sorry, I keep saying last question, but I la, my sorry. I. The last question I'm saving because it was my final question, but somebody asked it. But I want to ask you about um, Alexander Selivanov. Do you remember him, Selivanov? I remember him, yeah. I remember him. I, okay. I, I, so I, I played against him when I was in the Netherlands. Um, he was playing for Den Haag. I was only there for a couple of games because that's when I got addicted to the pills and nobody knew. And I was over there pretending like I had H1N1, but really I was withdrawing from uh, these pills from my knee injury, but it was horrible. But um, what was he like as an NHLer? Because I'll be honest, um, I don't like to talk ill of people or whatever, but when I was playing against him, the guy was hammered drunk, and um, but he was still so good. And when I talk to people that played against him, like they're like, yo, he could have been a really, really good NHLer. Um, what were your thoughts on him? I don't need to know any personal details about his problems or anything, but what was he like as a player as far as the NHL caliber goes? Well, you know what? It was funny. He had some good years in Tampa, and he played pretty well for them. And you know what? To be quite honest, I, I was pretty desperate in Columbus, looking for you know it was a it was a tough expansion era because four four expansion teams came in over like a two or three year period. We went in with Minnesota and Atlanta came in the year before us, and Nashville came in. So over a three year period, there was four teams. So it was pretty thin pickings, and I. I mean, I knew Sully from when he was in Tampa, and he was a pretty good player. I knew, I knew, I knew that he wasn't, you know, that he had some some issues. He was married to Phil Esposito's daughter, and I thought, well, that, does that tell you? Is that uh, maybe maybe he's okay? I like Sully as a guy. I, I tell you what, he was pretty good. He did. He was with me like a short period of time. He played pretty well. And I remember, I remember the day I let him go. It was like he was he was rocked. He was devastated, but. 
was he a was he a good liver? I I don't know. I had so many things on my plate. I don't <laughs> know if he was or not, to be quite honest. But he played pretty well for us. He was okay, but it, I, you know what? To be quite honest, that today's the first day I've thought of him since I let him go. So that tells you right there, doesn't it? Yeah, it's kind of, that kind of came I, out of left I, field, I, I forgot, didn't it? I forgot about that player. It's so bizarre, but I've had so many players in my career. Sort of when you're with expansion teams, you go through a lot of players, and you know I, it's it's funny how you uh, you have some guys you you totally forget about. But I, I like Selly, I really did. I mean, you know what? I got to tell you something. I was 22 years in the NHL, and I there's not a player I managed or coached that I didn't like as a person. There was lots of guys I didn't like how they played, but I, I I'm I'm hard pressed to find a guy in my 22 years in the league that I didn't like as a person. And there's not one guy that I ever coached or managed that I'd be afraid to sit down and have a beer with. Yeah. Some of them may not like me, but not a guy I'd be afraid to sit down and have a beer with and talk about our days together. So it's, that, that makes me feel good. Yeah. When, when you said that Sidney Crosby, you know, when obviously you said he's younger than you, but when he said that, you know, Mac gets it, um, and that meant something to you, uh, I agree with Sid. Like, when I watched you on Sportsnet uh, instantaneously, you know, you can tell that you just have a mind for the game and you got, you know, a tremendous respect right away. And I'll be honest, there's a whole, I feel like there's a void. Like, and there's no hockey right now, so there's an obvious void. But when you left and Kipper left, there was an, a void. And um, I don't want to be, have to, I was going to ask a question, but I'm going to leave it to I'll stamp someone else's name on this one. Um, um, call, uh, who was it? Uh, yeah, James B. Why did you leave Sportsnet? Uh, since you and Nick left, it really sucks. And I have to agree. Uh, before you answer that, I want to say to uh, Colin... Uh, no, we did that one. I'm sorry. Um, Jacob Jurgens too, wants to know about the Don, your thoughts on the Don Cherry incident. Um, they kind of like... Uh, I'm going to... Before you answer that, I'm pissed. I think the world's soft. I'm not, I don't have to go on TV and be a, uh, an analyst or worry about what I say and because, you know, but I believe the world's super soft. You can't say anything without getting in trouble. I can say whatever I want because this is my own show and I don't give a shit. But at the same time, I have a level of respect. But where is the yeah. world going and what, maybe you don't want to answer why you left. Uh, I didn't even really dig into why because maybe it's none of my business. But I will tell you right now, uh, without you, without Kipper, and without Don Cherry, because I'll be honest, I thought you were going to slip right into that role. Like, I'm going, okay, Don Cherry, I'm looking, at, I'm be honest, Google, how old's Don Cherry? Shit, he's getting pretty old, but he's looking pretty good. Like, he's still working. I'm yeah. thinking to myself, who's going to take over his job? And then I'm thinking, it's got to be, it's got to be Doug McClain. Like, and that's the natural fit. Like, that would have, you know what I mean? And then all of a sudden, you're gone, he's gone, Kipper's gone, and... I mean, you got maybe you got to be careful with how you answer this, but people want to know, yeah. and maybe, or maybe you can just answer with what's next for you, because I think that, like yeah. you said, Sidney Crosby wants like your opinion matters to Sidney Crosby. We need you on the air, Doug. Well, it's funny what happened, and I, you know, it, it didn't, it wasn't a, it wasn't a, a big deal, or it wasn't a scandal. What it was was, and I, I remember it, the guys were talking uh, about a, eight months to a year before. I left. I was in my last year of my contract, and look, they 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 gave me a good deal. I signed a five year deal when we got the NHL rights, and they were paying me five hundred thousand dollars a year. Wow. I mean, it was an unbelievable <laughs> gig, an unbelievable gig for me. It really was. So I remember, and and Kippy was making a lot more than that, and you know, Kippy, by the way, is one of my all time favorite guys. Uh, yeah, I, love Kipper, too, I love Kipper too, man. I love Kipper. I'd love I, to I, have I, him on. I would love to have him on and talk I, concussions, yeah. man. I really would. I, I I think the world of him. He's one of my best friends. But anyway, I, I remember telling the guys all year, guys, we started hearing rumblings that there was going to be ten million in cuts at Sportsnet, that they had to cut, and they were going to cut salaries. And I kept saying to the guys, I said, guys, they are not bringing me back at this kind of money. Not a chance of bringing me back at this kind of money. And guys are, oh no, Mac, that's not, you know, that that's that's not going to happen. And you know, then what happened was I. I, I I knew that there was no. I thought they would say, "Hey, do you want to do you want to come back for fifty percent? Do you want to?" And I I was living in Florida at the time and commuting. I'm still in. I'm lived down here, and I was commuting every week up back and forth. 
And I, you know what? I, you know, we'll see if they if they made me an offer, I'd consider it. But anyway, I, I walk in there in, in the uh, mid June for a meeting, and he said, you know, uh, the boss said, hey, your contract's expiring, and we're not going to renew it. And that's basically what it was. And I said, okay, fine. Uh, you know, you. Uh, I hope you treat some other people. And I, it was my. I had one more paycheck, and it was the next day. And I said, I hope you treat other people a little better than you just treated me. But I, you know what? I got treated really well. I've got no beefs. I had a good ten years there, and um, that. But it was strictly, it was strictly money. It was strictly money, and uh, and it was the same with Kippy and everybody else. So you know, they they had to make cuts, and unfortunately, that's what happened. So you know what? I was. It was kind of funny. I was. I had just turned sixty-five. I, I've had a good run. I'm not bitter. I've got no beefs with anybody, and I'm. Uh, I'm pretty content. So, uh, you know, Kippy and I may do something in the future, but right now we're just going to sit tight till we see where next season goes. Yeah, I could see you guys doing a podcast. I would definitely be tuning in every day. I'll be honest, like, when I, I loved Hockey Central at noon. I'm not a TSN guy. I, um, yeah. I'm i a Sportsnet guy. Um, always have been. Uh, Hockey Central at noon, Tim and Sid, these are the shows that I yeah. love. Um, but yeah, without you and Kipper there, and especially now Don Cherry, like I, I'll be honest, I could care less to even watch. I, I love what Colby Armstrong does, and I like Elliot Freeman. I like what I like their guys. I like Berkey too. But I, I, I'm pissed. Like I really, I think a lot of people are pissed. Like you grow to, you know what I mean? Like we respect your guys' opinions because we know that you guys know the game love the game have passion for the game and we trust you guys you know so for them to look at it as a dollar amount like how much money could they possibly be losing from that i think that's bullshit but again numbers thing it's not my thing but um what about the don cherry thing man like can you really Uh, comment on that or like like honestly i'm just it the world is so soft like i get it i get it but like what do you think well, grapes, you know, like he was—he was a great friend of mine, and it's funny. Every, almost, I think the last two times I got fired in Florida and and Columbus, he was the first call I had from from anybody saying, "Hey, Mac, hang in there. It's grapes calling." I mean, I, I really liked the guy. He was a good friend of mine. We used to talk a lot, and uh, you know, it, it was a sad way to end. I mean, grapes was eighty-five or eighty-six when it when it ended. It was a sad way to end. He made him. He made a mistake in today's in today's entertainment world. You you can't say that on on networks. And unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, I don't know wh- what transpired. I left him a message after. I left him a couple messages after because he he's not a real phone guy. And I I you know I felt felt terrible about it. But he you know what I he, he, I think at the end he made the call. I you know I think he could have apologized. No grapes is, is, from listening to him. He's not a guy that's going to do that. He just, I, I just think he said, "Hey, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm done." But yeah. I, it was sad because I, I thought the world of him, and I, you know, it's not the same. I mean, I've tried to watch Ron McLean, but Ron McLean without grapes, I'm sorry, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't happen for me right no, now. It doesn't, it doesn't happen for me either. And uh, you know, it's. It's sort of just disappointing and for me the way, way the world is. Uh, the way that I look at it, like Don Cherry said a lot worse things than that in his career, has he not? Like, oh. like oh. I mean, we go back to the 90s and stuff and it's like, man, like I remember like the Rock'em Sock'ems and some of the stuff he would say even on Hockey Night in Canada back then, but that's just the way the world is changed. And really, yeah. I, I yeah, agree with him. Changed. I wouldn't have apologized if I was him either because um, the way he worded it, maybe he could have worded it differently. But at the same time, he's not wrong in my opinion. And um, so we'll, we'll just leave that at that. And um, um, what about watching old games on TV? Is that doing it for you at all? Are you even tuning in to any old games or could you not be bothered with even watching hockey or... Or what are you, you guys? Know, what are you doing I, for entertainment? I got. I got to tell you, I'm. Uh, I played a lot of golf this year in Florida. Here, I. Then that ended, and I'm playing. I played a lot of tennis. My my son, who's an, a player agent in Chicago, league shut down. He came down, so so he's he's in his early thirties. He's been here for five weeks. He and I, and my daughter lives in Florida here. So it's been an unbelievable family time for us. We haven't had a chance to spend this much time together in years. So. We've really kind of enjoyed it. We, we, 
obviously we hate the virus situation it's devastating to the country and to the north america to the world but it's been a great family time so to be quite honest it's been tennis it's been uh sort of just sort of hanging around and it's been uh, a lot of movies i mean i'm i'm enjoying ozark and succession more than i am uh, old hockey games to be quite honest yeah i'm, I'm actually yeah, I'm just getting into ozark <laughs> yeah i'm just getting into so, ozark yeah. myself so <laughs> we, we have a lot of fun so i'm not i'm not missing it i mean we'll head to pei this summer you know we have a cottage in pei and we spend every summer there so we'll head up there in the uh in in probably early june hopefully and things calm down and we'll see what happens but uh, we love our time in pei and you know we're we're sort of spend it between florida and pei so it's pretty good yeah no doubt that must be nice i've actually never been out to pei but i've heard it's beautiful and i, I would definitely love to get out there and check it out i think me and my girlfriend are planning on driving out across out that way with the kids uh maybe next summer or something like that uh, my very very last question is uh is just regarding re concussions and uh and fighting in the game and and what are your yeah. thoughts on fighting going forward? Do you think that there should be rule changes uh, in the game? Um, and where do you see it going and, and with concussions and that sort of thing? And and did you see a lot of concussions? And do you think guys are still playing through a lot of concussions? Because I know I certainly did. Because if you're not a top-end yeah. guy, as you know, you got to keep playing, right? And um, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? And then we'll, I'll leave well, with that. you know what, look, I, I was sort of in the era where there was a ton of fights. And I told you about Pro B and Paul Laws and Jody Shelley. And I, I mean, I've been on the bench on ice at ice level watching watching Pro B or watching Shelley fight Beauregard right in front of our bench. And it was like, man, it was frightening to watch. I mean, Beauregard was as tough as they come. Shelly was as tough as they come, and they went at it toe-to-toe -to -toe standing in front of me. I watched Paul Laws, you know, fight the tough guys in his era. It, it was frightening to watch. Look, nobody likes to see guys with concussions. Nobody wants guys to play with concussions, but uh, you know what? It happened. It, it happened in the game, and uh, look, do I love to see a fight on the ice? Did I love to see it in my career? Yeah, I did. Did I like to see tough hockey? Yeah, I did. But uh, you know what? Look, it, it's a devastating thing. It's affected a lot of guys. I've had guys that never had a fight in their career who, who are not in good shape because of concussions. I dealt with Kippy every day. Kippy had eight or ten concussions in his career. And and he's a guy that's afraid, nervous about it, you know, as to how it affects his life. So it's 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 a it's one of the it's one of the tough things about the game that none of us like. And hopefully, hopefully, we continue to find answers. But do should there be fighting? I'm telling you, man, some of the fights I saw, it was it was tough sledding out there. I, I don't wish it on anybody. I really don't. No kidding. Yeah. Well, that's that's yeah. great, um, Doug. Uh, I listen. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you doing this. You've been talking to me for an hour and 20 minutes. Like I could never even have dreamed this scenario up even a month ago, buddy. And, uh, yeah. so I, you know, I really appreciate it. And, um, you know, for the first time in my life, I think I actually feel good about something. Even when I felt good when I was playing hockey, yeah. I was still felt nervous and pressure. And, and uh, yeah. like I say this before, like maybe this isn't all the answers, but it's certainly oh. opening a lot of doors. And uh, to have your support and for you to come on here, like you really, really have no idea how much this means to me. And, uh, you know, so for you to do something like this now, it's like how the hell am I going to let Doug McLean down? You know what I mean? So. <laughs> yeah, don't worry about it. Look, man, don't I... I, I want to wish you all the best on it. I think it's great. I think it's uh, it's exciting for you and the fans to get a good insight into hockey. So continue good luck with it. You've got my number, and if you if you ever need me to go on again, you know, anytime, feel free to give me a call or send me a note anytime if you need me to come on. Anytime. Okay. All right, Doug. That's uh, the pride of Summerside PEI's Doug McLean. Thank you so much, Doug. Uh, take care okay, of your man. family in this crazy time, and we'll talk soon. Take care, bud. Okay, yes. thanks again, Doug. A uh, huge thanks to Doug McLean. I, I really can't thank him enough. Uh, the fact that he uh, even listened to my podcast meant the world to me. Uh, for him to come on and just give him give me uh, his support means the world to me. And uh, actually, there's so many of you guys. Thank you, thank you so much for your support. And um, you know, thank you for your questions for Doug and just being a part of that, guys. For uh, 
you know, for making that new segment of my podcast a, a real thing and, and participating. So thank you guys. And um, the audio quality of Doug wasn't the greatest. Uh, I had to record it uh, through us, him on speakerphone through my phone. Um, I don't have the best equipment right now. I, I don't have a whole lot of money. Um, but I did get a new microphone today, uh, last minute thing. Um, so hopefully my audio quality was a lot is better, and I think it is. Um, um, so at this time, I want to thank my dad, Brian. Uh, he paid for the mic for me. Um, dad, thank you. I love you. Um, I'm going to leave you guys with the song. Uh, this is Stained. It's been a while. This song, guys, is one of my all-time favorites. And if you listen to the end, there's a line in the song that really hits home for me. And there's a line that says, I cannot blame this on my father. He did the best he could for me. And uh, if there's one thing in my story, that's certainly true. Um, my dad did everything he possibly could for me. Um, the decisions that I made have no reflection of him and uh, I'm sure he's baffled and I know he's extremely disappointed in me but um, I'm working on mending that relationship with my dad and also with a lot of people and my family members uh, friends I haven't talked to in a long time and uh, maybe people that I've heard and that uh, I have a long ways to go guys but you know it's one day at a time and your support really means the world to me It's been a while since I could Hold my head up high And it's been a while Since I first saw you I'm back.
It's been a while since I said I'm sorry. 